All right, hi everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us for our webinar, Picks, Texts, and Tracking, Understanding and Addressing Digital Dating Abuse. Relationship violence is a common problem for young people today. While providers may be familiar with some forms of power and control, including verbal, emotional, and physical abuse, many adults are less familiar with the ways technology and social media can be used as tools of power and control in dating situations. This webinar will start by exploring the most common ways that technology and social media can be used in abusive situations and end with practical strategies that providers and other adults can use to identify warning signs of digital dating abuse and have critical conversations with youth experiencing and perpetrating this type of abuse. The School-Based Health Alliance works to improve the health of children and youth by advancing and advocating for school-based health care. We believe that all children and adolescents deserve to thrive, but too many struggle because they lack access to healthcare services. School-based healthcare is the solution, bringing healthcare to where students already spend the majority of their time, in school. When health and education come together, great things happen. Attendance improves, conditions like asthma or diabetes are better managed, and behavioral health issues get quick expert attention. And we all know that healthy students make better learners. Now we have a few housekeeping reminders. All attendees are in listen-only mode. However, we want to hear your questions. To ask a question at any point during the webinar, please use the Q&A tool located in your Zoom control bar. We will address questions following the presentation. If you would like to add your comments through the chat function, please select all panelists and attendees before sending the message so everyone can see it. We plan to have closed captioning for this webinar and we will let you know when that is active. In the meantime, to turn it on, click on the CC or closed captioning button on the Zoom control bar. At the end of this webinar, attendees will be asked to complete evaluation poll questions. Please let us know how we are doing. Your feedback is vital in helping us craft presentations that meet your needs. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived on our website in one to three business days. Please also visit the School-Based Health Alliance for additional archived webinars for topics such as the ones you are viewing on your screen. This webinar is the second in our three-part IPV series. The series is part of a larger body of work funded by the Bureau of Primary Healthcare, BIPIC. Through BIPIC, the School-Based Health Alliance has a national training and technical assistant partnership to support health centers in serving school-aged children. We invite you to join us for the next webinar, which will be a youth-led webinar on utilizing media to talk about relationship abuse with young people. We will share the registration link for that session in the chat. It can also be found on our website. Now I would like to introduce our presenter for today. Kaylee Corneliuson is currently the lead program specialist with the Adolescent Health Initiative, where she oversees the development and delivery of the evidence-based adolescent champion model and the adolescent-centered environment assessment process. She obtained her master's degree in social work from Washington University in St. Louis with a specialization in nonprofit management and her bachelor's degree in communication studies from the University of Michigan. Prior to working at AHI, she worked in St. Louis and Los Angeles in youth serving nonprofits, schools, and healthcare. She was most recently the training coordinator for the Community Clinic Association of Los Angeles County, where she developed and coordinated professional development opportunities for federally qualified health centers across LA. Kaylee is passionate about supporting young people by empowering the adults in their lives to meet them where they are. And now I will hand it over to Kaylee. Thanks so much, Maddie. All right, I'm gonna share my screen now. All right, great. So thanks so much to the School-Based Health Alliance for having me. Um, like Maddie mentioned, um, I'm the lead program specialist at the Adolescent Health Initiative. My background is in social work. Um, and I'm also, I forgot to put this in my bio, I'm also currently an adjunct professor at the University of Michigan School of Social Work, which has a, been a fun new adventure for me. And I'm used to talking to a room where I can't see anybody else because my students are so over having their cameras on right now. So <laughs> this is totally normal. Um, I would like to just reiterate what Maddie said about the chat. Um, if you click on the little part that says all panelists and choose all panelists and attendees, Everybody can see your comments. Um, and I'm gonna be asking you to chat in on a couple of different questions or activities throughout the workshop. So 
Um, would love for everyone to see your responses when we're doing that. So a little bit more about me. Um, my first job in my social work career, actually, for four years, I ran a teen dating violence and sexual assault prevention program for middle and high school students um, in St. Louis. And now at AHI, I work a little bit more holistically on adolescent health. Um, but this opportunity has really um, been a chance for me to um, get back to my roots and sort of get back to some of the work that I did when I when I first got into my social work career. So I just want to make sure that I'm sharing the correct screen here. I'm going to stop and just make sure I've got the right one up. There we go. All right, so a little bit more about the Adolescent Health Initiative. We are based out of the University of Michigan, but we provide training, technical assistance, consulting, and resource development to healthcare providers, health systems, and youth serving organizations across the country. And we're currently working in over 40 states. And our vision is to transform the healthcare landscape to optimize adolescent and young adult health and well being. So here are some of our objectives for today. Um, my goal is for you all to be able to define digital dating abuse and how it connects to larger systems of power and control. Um, we're gonna review how digital dating abuse can show up on different social media platforms and how it might impact young people's mental health. We'll explore how digital dating abuse can look different for youth depending on their identities. And finally, we'll learn strategies to open up conversations about this um, and maybe help us identify and support youth who are coping with or perpetrating digital dating abuse. So here is sort of our first warm up activity to get you thinking a little bit about some behaviors that we might see um, from some of the adolescents in our lives. So I want you to consider and then chat in your response. Um, for each one of these situations. So consider if your adolescent patients were doing the following or having the following done to them. Do you think it is healthy, unhealthy, or abusive? So the first scenario is messaging someone 10 times without a response. So chat in healthy, unhealthy, or abusive. Okay, I'm getting quite a lot of unhealthies and a few abusives strung in there. Great, yeah. Yep, yep. So this is a good one. So this one, you know, we're sort of towing this line. It, it might be unhealthy um, or it might be abusive. And then someone just chatted in, what if it's their mom? So the context is really important, right? And it starts to get us thinking, well, how many times is okay to text someone without a response in a row? I might text my mom 10 times in a row if I don't hear back and I'm worried something's wrong. Um, and then thanks, Lisa, for your comment. It's maybe abusive. It depends on what's in the text, right? So if in the text, it's more of a concern or um, checking in, versus if it's something that's threatening or um, trying to control where they are, what they're doing, trying to snoop or something like that, that context is gonna make a difference. So next one, sending 50 texts back and forth with your partner in one day. Healthy, unhealthy, or abusive, what do you all think? Mm -hmm. Great, I'm getting a range of responses. You have context matters, depends on the content. I've seen unhealthy, healthy, and abusive coming through. Yeah, depends. A lot of people are saying, yeah, maybe it depends. Absolutely, I would agree, it depends on the context. So thinking about, you know, are we going back and forth? Are we... What are we talking about? Is it a supportive conversation? Um, some people might think that this is too much, but if you really sit back and think maybe about your significant other or 
a really close friend, if you're in a conversation, how many texts do you have back and forth? So again, we have to put this in a little bit of context. It's not maybe one to jump to conclusions about. We want to know more about it. How about following all of their partner's friends on Instagram and Snapchat? Healthy, unhealthy, or abusive? Unhealthy, unhealthy. I'm getting a few of those. It's extra. <laughs> Great. Depends. Depends. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that they're insecure. So again, this one, we want to think a little bit more about this. What's the context? Yeah, why would they do it? So it could be that I really want my partner to be Snapchat and Instagram friends with all of my friends. Yeah, maybe we have the same friend circle, Kat. That's a great point. So we're all following each other. We're in a group snap. We're sending each other cute memes on Instagram, whatever that might be. If, however, they're following all of my friends because they want to keep track of me, see where I am, um, what am I doing, where am I at, different type of situation. Yeah. And I see your comment here, social media is unhealthy for most youth. I can't say that I agree with that. I have a really strong belief that um, social media is a tool and it all depends on how it's used. There's a lot of different ways that social media can be used for young people. And we're kind of going to talk about that a little bit today. Today, we're mostly talking about unhealthy and abusive behaviors that come from dating abuse situations. Um, but that's not always the case. A lot of young people use social media for activism, um, creativity, and different things like that. So um, especially right now when we're all stuck at home, they're using it for social engagement, Judy, like you're saying in the chat too. So we're going to try and keep a little bit of an open mind with that today. So I don't want to belabor this point. I think you get what I'm saying is that it's all about the context. So thinking about a couple of these other situations, you don't have to respond to all of these. Um, but, you know, there are certain things that are definitely a red flag, like this next one, asking their partner to send an explicit picture that no one else will see. Right. So that is definitely a red flag. It might not necessarily be abusive, but it's definitely falling into that unhealthy category. Um, Something like posting on social media that they had a fight with their partner. Again, this could be taken in a couple of different ways. It could be maybe a little bit of an immature way to reach out for support, or it could be a way to put their partner on blast that can maybe fall into that abusive category. Um, and then definitely this last example, using technology to monitor where their partner is and what they're doing without their knowledge. That's where definitely falling into that abusive um, sort of realm. So I try to keep this spectrum in mind when I'm thinking about um, dating abuse in general, but specifically about digital dating abuse, because the context matters a lot. We want to be sort of in tune to some of those different, um, different pieces of the context when we're learning um, from the young people in our lives what's going on. Yeah. All right. So throughout the workshop today, we're going to be sort of um, pinging in on a variety of different strategies when it comes to this topic. So the first one I would say is to be aware and know the facts. So that's going to get us into our definition of what is digital dating abuse. So it's a pattern of technology facilitated controlling behaviors exhibited by one person toward another within a current or former romantic relationship. So I like this definition because it's speaking to the technology facilitated piece of it. Um, it's also pointing out that it could be a current or former romantic relationship. Sometimes we see these types of behaviors escalate um, when relationships end, when the abusive partner um, has lost control out of that situation. And then it also points out it's a controlling behavior, right? Getting to the root of what abuse is about, which is, power and control. And then our second definition here, using technology to repeatedly harass a romantic partner with the intent to control, coerce, intimidate, annoy, or threaten them. So again, I like this definition because it, it has that repetitively piece in there. Um, and it also sort of lays out a couple of different intents, control, curse, intimidate, annoy, or threaten. Um, and the annoy in there, um, gets me thinking about 
how sometimes abusive partners can minimize the things that they're doing. Oh, I'm, I'm just doing it to annoy you. I'm just doing it to tease you and sort of downplaying some of those behaviors. So I'm glad that this definition calls that out specifically. And what's helpful to know is that both of these definition, definitions are getting at that it's a pattern of behavior, right? It's something that is happening over time more than once um, that actually is showing us signs of abusive behavior, right? So keeping in mind that it's a pattern. So again, just in this vein of knowing the facts, I wanted to share some research that was actually published in, in 2020, just last year, about digital dating abuse specifically. So this was a national sample of U.S. youth, um, about 2,000 of these young people in middle and high school who have been in a relationship. So they're taking just a sample of those who have been in a relationship between 12 and 17 years old. And this was in the Journal of Interpersonal Violence. So about 28% of these youth um, did have experience with digital dating abuse. And I'm just gonna note um, the research study um, used binary pronouns. They just used he and she. And so I, I used it verbatim here, but I just wanted to point out that um, they didn't do a good job at looking at non-binary or trans youth who use other pronouns here. So the different forms of digital dating abuse that they saw were that um, they looked through the contents of their phone. That was the most common form of digital dating abuse that they saw that they prevented a partner from using a cell phone, tablet, or other device, second most common. They threatened you in a text message, posted something publicly online to make fun of, threaten, or embarrass someone, or posted online or shared with others a private picture without permission. So those are really the top, I guess those are five um, different um, forms of they say victimization, I would say, you know, digital dating abuse tactics um, that they saw in this study. So adding that up to 28% of youth who had experienced that. So from the same study, there, there was a lot of good information in there, but something else that I, I thought was really um, telling and really helpful for us if we're um, maybe identifying some of these abusive behaviors um, in our clients or patients, um, that 81% who had experienced dating abuse, digital dating abuse, also had experienced traditional dating abuse. And by traditional, they mean um, verbal, mental, emotional, or physical abuse sort of in person. So if we're seeing a sign of digital dating abuse, it's pretty likely that other forms of dating abuse are happening for that same young, per young person. So that's really important for us to keep in mind. When it comes offline, not that it's any less hurtful when it's happening online or in a digital space, um, but it often happens across the board um, is what this research is telling us. Again, this research study did not account for non-binary or trans youth. So um, they're reporting males and females here. So they say 32% of males and 23% of females reported experiencing digital dating abuse. So this was also interesting. I think that often um, we see, um, when we think about intimate partner violence for adults, we often see more um, women identified folks or femme folks as survivors of, of dating violence or intimate partner violence. We know that for adolescents or for teens, that gender difference is, is a little bit different. It's not as stark for, for this age group. And that was represented in this study as well. Um, the study also showed that other demographics such as sexual orientation and race and age didn't impact the rates of digital dating abuse in this particular study. I'm going to speak a little bit about a couple of other studies where that wasn't the case, but in this particular study, they didn't see any differences based on sexual orientation, race, or age. That's not to say that tactics around abuse may have looked different based on sexual orientation, race, and age. I think that very often we see with LGBTQ plus youth that some of the abusive strategies are 
threats of outing someone to their family or to groups that they don't want to be outed to, um, posting things about their sexual orientation online. We might see some of that, but the rates um, of digital dating abuse were not different based on any of these other demographics in this particular study. So there is a little bit more research um, that maybe wasn't quite as robust, but I, I did want to mention here. So there was a study in social work research in September 2020, so very recent, of Latinx youth experiences with digital dating abuse. So it was a fairly small study, um, but results from that showed that uh, this was about 70 Latinx youth in that study. Um, so pretty small, but it did show that Latinx youth experienced digital dating abuse. And then again, there was a strong link between digital abuse and offline forms of dating abuse. So very similar to, to the bigger study that we were looking at here. And then there was another study that is a little bit old now. It's always funny to think that 2013 still feels so recent to me, but um, almost eight years ago now. Um, that study was also a fairly large study. It was really focused on the Northeast part of the United States. Um, it showed about the same rates of digital dating abuse, about 26%, as opposed to this, stu this study's 28%. Um, it also connected between online and offline abuse. However, it reported that more females than males reported digital dating abuse, which was a switch from um, the larger study that we're looking at here. And it also reported that um, LGBTQ plus youth reported higher rates of cyber dating abuse than heterosexual youth. So just wanted to give you all the full context of some of the data that's out there. There's not a ton. Um, but just to sort of get you the best information that we have um, around digital dating abuse specifically. So the next strategy I would say is to try to understand the bigger picture. Let's put this in a little bit of context. So many of you may be familiar with the power and control wheel. There's also a, a teen specific power and control wheel. And again, I'm gonna say it's a little bit outdated because some of the, uh, the pronouns in here are very gendered, um, but I think it's a nice resource still to sort of get the context of power and control as a whole. Um, so looking at this, this really focuses on um, those in-person forms of power and control. But I'm wondering, as you look at this image, what if any of these strategies of abuse, so you can see here peer pressure, anger and emotional abuse, using social status, intimidation, minimize denying and blaming, threats, sexual coercion and isolation or exclusion, which ones of those do you think could be perpetrated in a digital space, either via text or social media? This is a very smart audience because yes, it was a trick question, all of them, I agree. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through a couple of examples of how that would look. But off the top of y'all's heads, is there any specific digital dating abuse um, tactic that you might put on this wheel that y'all could identify? Any specific tactic that comes to mind? Threats, yep. Threats could be happening over social media or a text message. Same with coercion. Yeah, intimidation, posting things online to embarrass or threatening to, absolutely. App location tracking, yes. Pressuring. Yeah, and there was a question about, is there a gender neutral version of the teen power and control wheel? I'll be honest with you, usually when I've used this wheel, I've edited it myself <laughs> to make it more gender neutral, but it looks like someone in the chat also posted their email address that they have a version that they could share. So thanks for saying that. Yeah, intimidation and blackmail, demanding pictures, pressure to post public posts. Yep, gaslighting, y'all got it, absolutely. 
So I'm going to run through a few examples here, but I think you all totally um, are hitting on it in the chat too. So in terms of emotional views, sending hurtful messages or social media posts about them um, that are angry or I'm putting them down. Using social status, um, saying that they have to keep a certain persona on social media or telling them they have to ask permission before posting something because they wanna look like a certain type of couple. Intimidation, so stalking or using tracking, using phones or social media or different apps that was also mentioned in the chat. Minimize, deny, and blame. So something like, oh, it's not a big deal. Everyone shares passwords and reads each other's texts. No big deal, why won't you let me? Everyone does it. Threats, again, this was um, mentioned in the chat. Threats to share private messages or pictures threats to out them on social media. Sexual coercion, y'all mentioned this too, pressuring them to send sexual photos or videos. Isolation or exclusion, controlling who they can interact with on social media or via text. So something like, oh, I saw you commented on so-and-so, I don't want you to do that, or um, I'm gonna break up with you if you do that, or I'm gonna post this about you if you do that, or, um, just like was just mentioned in the chat, giving them the silent treatment on social media or um, on text, so not returning a text message up or blocking them on Instagram or Snapchat when they're angry with them. And then finally, the peer pressure. I, what comes to mind to, with this to me is that constant messaging. Where are you? What are you doing? Who are you with? Constantly blowing up their phone over and over and over um, puts a lot of pressure on someone to feel like they have to always be on their phone, always responding. Um, and again, when this becomes a pattern, we see this as a way to have power and control from one partner over the other. So this gets to my piece a little bit about um, social media. I think that often as adults, we um, have this instinct, like social media is really bad for you. Well, there are some, you know, um, hypotheses about social media, um, but very few uh, actual causations when it comes to social media and negative outcomes for youth. So um, we're in a world where social media is not going anywhere. It's, it's really here to stay. And it's really that something that most, not all, but most adolescents use a lot and enjoy. And um, it can help us to connect with them to recognize that, to ask them about it, to learn what type of apps they use and what they like to use so we can give them the skills and information around how to do it safely and appropriately and to notice those red flags when um, something isn't right, like in a case of digital dating abuse. So just to share a little bit of data um, about the fact that screen time is here to stay Social media is here to stay. So this is from a really excellent resource if you're not familiar with it, um, Common Sense Media. They do a lot more around just um, media literacy and research around media, social media use and screen time and things like that. A little bit less on digital dating abuse stuff, but I still thought that these stats were um, relevant to our conversation today. So this is from a study they did in 2019 that, um, for tweens, <laughs> which I, I kind of laugh at that term, but they use that term, tweens and teens are all using a ton of screen time. So for tweens, it's almost five hours. And for teens, it's just over seven hours. And that was two years ago. So it could have gone up even more, especially this year, um, I guess in the last year and some change now. Um, and this, this um, number does not account for school or homework. So that's outside of school time. Also, smartphone ownership has also risen dramatically, even among the youngest teens or tweens, as they say. So you can see here um, anywhere from eight years old all the way up to 18. And the difference between 2015 when they did the, a similar study to 2019 when they repeated it. So in um, 2019, 91% of 18-year-olds had a smartphone, 
and 77% of 77 percent um, of seventy seven percent did in twenty fifteen. And you can sort of see that um, as the age goes up, obviously the ownership of the smartphone goes up. I can speak from my um, personal experience that my nephew, who is in eighth grade, um, just got a cell phone over Christmas, but his younger sister, who's in sixth grade, got one about six months later. No, I guess it was about a year and six months later. I'm getting my timelines mixed up, but sort of as we're getting more clocked into social media and phones and not having landlines and things like that, younger and younger youth are having access to smartphones earlier and earlier. So it's something just for us to keep in mind and to know this probably isn't going to change anytime soon. So we have to educate ourselves on what young people are using their phones for, um, ask them in non-judgmental ways to explain it to us. I always say, if you know the young people in your community are using a particular app a lot, let's download it and um, get the same app so we can learn what they're doing on it and we know a little bit about how it works. So that's how I ended up on TikTok. And um, I feel like my life is better for it. So that's just a little bit of the overview of um, social media use and, and how it's here to stay. All right. So next thing, what knowing what to look for when it comes to digital dating abuse. So again, thinking about just social media preferences in general, um, this is from um, 20 years of research on teens and Gen Z. This was published last year in the fall. So you can see that the highest social media engagement from this age group is Instagram, Snapchat, and then TikTok was um, third. And then after that, it really drops down. Twitter was 39% engagement versus 69% engagement for TikTok. So if we're sort of thinking about social media and where some of this digital dating abuse might be taking place, it's safe to say that some of these top engagement apps um, are places where we want to keep an eye out for it. And then you can also see it's just in a different order. The favorite social media platforms are um, Snapchat, TikTok, and Instagram. So out of any of those, I would really say those are the ones that we want to try to educate ourselves on a little bit more and just be aware of that. Now, it might be different in your particular community, which is why it's great to have conversations just in general about what apps are you using, what's fun and entertaining to you, how do you use these apps, how do you see your friends using them, and just sort of opening up. Um, that conversation. So common forms of digital dating abuse, I think that that um, initial research study really hit on a lot of the, the key ones. But just to recap here, so we see a lot preventing a partner from using a computer or cell phone. So taking their phone away, preventing them from using it. Um, guilting them maybe for using it when they're together, restricting who they talk to on social media um, or on their phone, um, posting something publicly to make fun of, threaten, or embarrass their partner, um, looking through a partner's phone without permission, or pressuring them to let you do so. So a lot of times when I was teaching about dating abuse and healthy relationships with youth, there's sometimes a skewed belief that if my partner isn't jealous, then um, they don't love me enough, right? And so this was a part of that, that looking through their phone. So if they don't wanna look through my phone, then um, they don't care enough. So sometimes we also have to address some of those core beliefs when it comes to why we're doing these types of things. Um, sending threatening messages um, is a big piece of this too, either um, private messaging on, um, social media or via text, pressuring to send explicit photos or videos. And that could be just standing alone by itself and or um, sharing them or posting them after they've been received. So sharing it with just one person, sharing it with a bunch of different people, threatening to share it when um, they're in a fight or you're angry with them or you want them to do something that they're not, not doing. Um, Something else that I tend to mention to youth um, about sharing explicit photos is that depending on what state you're in, 
um, the laws can still consider it creation and um, distribution of child pornography or possession of child pornography, again, depending on the age of the youth and the state's particular laws. Um, so if I'm a young person who's taken a photo that's explicit and then sent it, I could hypothetically be charged with um, creation and then um, distribution. So I like to let them know about that because um, that can be an extremely long-term consequence for them when it, when it comes to photos that they might not see as being a big deal, um, either within an unhealthy or abusive relationship or outside of it. And then the constant messaging, um, which I wanna show you a short little video clip of an example of that in just a minute. But any other common forms of digital dating abuse that you all have seen that, I, that we haven't mentioned here? Tracking phone, having passwords. Yeah, yeah, that pressure, like give me your password to Instagram. Give me your password to your email or whatever, yeah. The tracking phone, that, I mean, that is so easy too, especially if um, someone has a, an iPhone. Just share your location with me. That's not a big deal. Sharing a social media page rather than having their own account. That one's really interesting, Stephanie, because I haven't seen that as much lately, um, but I did maybe a couple of years ago. So that's interesting to hear that, that you've still seen that. Requiring location share, controlling who they follow or friend. Yep. Stalking their social media pages. Yeah. Stealing passwords and posting on their behalf. Yep. Catfishing. Mm -hmm. Going through a partner's friend to access the partner. Yeah. Involving them. Yep. Yeah. Even spoofing to play a joke on them. And oftentimes that's where we see a little bit of that gaslighting or um, sort of downplaying the behavior. Oh, it was just a joke. It was just for fun. You're overreacting. Um, and then the person who is being uh, controlled or abused is gonna feel like, well, maybe am I? They're telling me I am. I guess I'm overreacting and they start to second guess. Yeah. Oh, this is a good example, creating a different account to get information about their partner. So creating, like, as the young people would say, Finstagram or fake Instagram to learn more information about somebody um, without using their actual account. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so lots of good examples here. I really appreciate you all um, throwing these in here. Unliking posts, oh, good point, Kat, yeah. So um, that can be really important to a lot of young people is having a certain number of likes on a post. And so unliking if you're in a fight or um, as a way to punish someone for something that they've done or haven't done. Yeah. Kaylee, I'm going to jump in. Um, this is so exciting and I'm, I'm really enjoying listening to you. Um, there are a number of great questions, which I don't think we need to get to now, but I do just want to call out that we might be at about the 10 minute mark. Oh, okay. Do we have until three o'clock? We do. So I thought maybe we could do like another 10 minutes of content and then we could save oh. the last 10 for questions. Oh, okay. I got you, Emily. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Because I was thinking, oh no, I have to start questions now and I have a little bit more content. I got you. Yes. 10 more minutes. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks, Emily. Yeah. So thank you all for your examples. Um, you get the idea. You definitely get the idea. So I just wanna show you this short video. Um, I'm going to mm -hmm, make sure that I'm optimizing for sound and for video. Here we go. All right. This is another example of what this constant messaging or as this clip is called textual harassment um, looks like. G morning, sunshine. Wakey, wakey. Text me back. Hey, did you tell your parents about us? Let's skip first period together. 
Did you get all my text? Is practice over yet? Where are you at? Are you with your friends? That's L A A A A M M E E E. Capital X, lowercase O. Capital X, lowercase O. I love you. J K. I hate you. J K. Are you ignoring me? We're in a huge fight right now. Is this something I did? I can see your lights on. I'm coming over. What did you dream about? Me? I'm lonely. Holla back. Holla back. Let's try something new. Nude pics. Send me some. Text me. Right. Yeah, yikes is right. I don't have a link to this video. It's a, it's a little old, I'm going to be honest with you, but if you do look on YouTube for textual, hara textual harassment, it might still be on there. I do have this downloaded for, from many moons ago. Um, so it's just an example of that back and forth. I love you. I hate you. Um, are you home? I see your lights on like this constant nonstop all throughout the day. It's like that that voice inside your head that's um, constantly getting to you. So yeah, and Stella, that's a really good question. I wonder how it looks when it's a girl harassing a boy or maybe um, you know in a same sex relationship. Um, I think it looks very similar. You know, I think that um, some of these behaviors, um, you know, like we talked about, they didn't see a lot of differences between um, you know LGBTQ folks, um, folks of color, this was all sort of very similar types of behaviors across the board. Yeah, and that's not cool.com. I have a list of resources at the end and, and that is one of them. They have some really nice stuff specifically related to this topic. So next strategy is let's just think about starting the conversation. Um, if you're doing risk screening in your setting, um, you could consider adding a, a question or two to your screening tool. So for example, something like in the past month, have you been threatened, teased, or hurt by someone on the internet, by text, or in person, um, causing you to feel sad, unsafe, or afraid? So this specifically says, you know, on the internet, by text, or in person. So that's a helpful um, call out. And then you also have a question like, has anyone ever physically injured you? or force you to have sex or be involved in sexual activities and when you didn't want to. And what we know about the correlation between in-person abuse and digital abuse, um, if we're seeing some of this in-person stuff, there's a good chance it's gonna be um, online as well. So that can be another um, red flag. Another screener that's specific for intimate partner violence is the HITS um, screener. Um, again, this doesn't specifically ask about digital abuse, but again, that correlation is so strong that you could um, um, maybe ask some other additional questions as a follow-up with, with that. Also, if you have the opportunity to raise awareness in your setting, um, it's great to get out ahead of this and get young people thinking about what is a healthy relationship? We talk with them so much about unhealthy or abusive relationships, um, or they see a lot of examples in media about this, um, but we don't often ask them like, well, what do you think is healthy? What is it that you want in a dating relationship? Um, what are you actually interested in? What are the qualities? Um, what is, um, who are your relationship role models and what is it about them that you look up to? So making sure we talk about that positive side of it too. Um, and also just asking about relationships and social media use, not assuming the worst right away. Um, also awareness campaigns and prevention education around these topics, um, like I mentioned, is so great and important. And I actually wanted to share um, a couple of examples that are from TikTok, um, which obviously is a, um, a platform that a lot of young people are into right now. Um, that include some awareness raising campaigns um, about dating abuse. So I'm gonna share that now. Red flag. Red flag. Red flag. 
red flag. So you can see a couple of pretty cool examples using some of the classic things that people do on TikTok to raise awareness about digital dating abuse or dating abuse in general. So the person on the left is, I think, more from an adult standpoint, um, but the young person on the right um, is doing that classic thing where they play two roles and sort of act something out in, in the TikTok and really goes to show like she kind of gets fed up at the end is like, no, forget it. I'm looking at loveisrespect.org and I'm going to block this person. So um, I thought this was a nice way to show that um, young people are very creative with the way that they use technology and um, they can, it can be used for awareness raising or for, for something positive too. So Last piece, I just wanted to share a couple of specific scenarios and get us talking about how we might intervene in these types of situations. So first scenario, your primary care provider at an SBHC, and during a routine visit, one of your patients answers yes to the following risk screening question, which is the one that I mentioned before, in the past month, have you been threatened, teased, or hurt by someone um, causing you to feel sad, unsafe, or afraid? So how could you open up the conversation with this patient during the visit? So what might you say? What might you say to open up this conversation during a visit with the youth who had said yes to this risk screening question? Yep, can you share what happened? Tell me more about that, yeah, great. Would it be okay if we talked a bit more about this question? Really good one, Jerry, thank you. Yeah. Would you be comfortable sharing more about this? Do you mind letting me know what's going on? I love that permission asking. Yeah, remind them that it's confidential, yeah. And the limitations of that confidentiality, right? Tell me more about your relationships. I'm here to listen. Great, excellent. Yeah, and I said something else, something very similar to what you all are saying, yeah. Um, I noticed you said yes to this question about being threatened, teased, or hurt by someone in the last month. Can you tell me more about that? And then moving on, um, your patient, same scenario, your patient goes on to tell you that her boyfriend has been making negative comments about her on social media, commenting on photos and videos that she looks like a slut and telling her that she better deactivate her Instagram account or he'll break up with her. She tells you, he's really sweet to me the rest of the time. He just gets insecure about the photos I post. I'm thinking about just not posting anything new for a while. So with this new information, how might you respond next? Yeah, how does that make you feel? Yeah, you could have the power and control wheel on hand. Yeah. Yeah, despite the being sweet, it is still unhealthy behavior. Is this what he wants or you want? Yeah, asking about what she knows about abuse. How do you feel? Yeah. Does that make you feel like you're allowed to be yourself? Do you feel safe? Yeah. Bringing up safety is great. 
Great answers here. Absolutely. Absolutely. So just another um, sort of phrase or idea. I think you all are totally on this too. So um, hearing your boyfriend is making those negative comments about you concerns me a little. Oftentimes when that happens, there are other unhealthy things going on in the relationship. Is there anything else he does that makes you feel uncomfortable or put down? Yeah. And of course, yeah, you definitely want to be talking about confidentiality from the beginning. Um, I like that, Catherine, a lot. How would you feel if one of your friends was experiencing this? What advice would you give them? That's such a great suggestion. One thing I would note is that it's really, I think, important to validate feelings, um, but also point out the unhealthy or abusive behaviors. So yeah, it sounds like he could be really sweet. And some of these things that I'm hearing you say don't sound like the healthiest um, in a relationship. Again, and then going into some, maybe some of the other things that, that y'all mentioned. I wanna be aware of my time here, um, but I'm gonna give you just a couple more scenarios and I'll just sort of walk through these um, very briefly so we have time for questions. Um, so during the visit, an adolescent patient is extremely distracted by their phone, which is buzzing constantly. When you ask them to set their phone aside for the rest of the visit, they hesitate and tell you, I would, but my girlfriend gets really mad when I don't answer her text right away. I don't want her to think that I'm doing something wrong. And so again, I'm sure you all would have great um, responses to this, but a couple of thoughts might be, huh, tell me more about that. Why would you think, why would she think you're doing something wrong? What happens when you don't answer her text right away? What does getting really mad look like? Or even just naming it, constant messaging is something that I've seen sometimes in relationships that are struggling with trust. Is that something that's an issue with you too? And then another scenario could be that your school just had an awareness program about teen dating violence that included classroom presentations, social media campaigns. And just as you're wrapping up a visit with an adolescent patient, of course, they always bring this stuff up at the very end. Um, he tells you that there's one more thing he wanted to ask you about. He says, we just had this talk in class about unhealthy relationships. My girlfriend always makes me show her my text and wants me to share my iPhone location with her. Is that abusive? This is always the hard one for me when young people have flat out just said, is it abusive if, and again, like we talked about at the beginning, so much depends on context. So it's hard to say yes or no, if you don't know more. So what you could say is something like, thanks so much for asking me about this. What do you think about having to show her your text or share your location? Or I don't know if it's abusive, but it doesn't sound very healthy to me. What do you think are some of the qualities of a healthy relationship? Or oftentimes we don't think of controlling actions like that as unhealthy or abusive. So I'm glad that you're thinking about this and then maybe doing a referral. Our social worker is actually here today and knows a lot about this topic. Would you want to chat with her for a bit? So just a couple of scenarios to get us thinking about if we were in that moment and the young person was bringing it up or saying yes on a screener, um, that we could have some, like we've done so many good responses in the chat of how you would actually respond in that moment to support that young person, call out the unhealthy or abusive behaviors and um, support them in that moment. So a couple of other strategies, and I think that we've touched on a lot of these, validating feelings, knowing your supports, understanding fears or hesitations about leaving or breaking up. That's such a, a dangerous time often for people in abusive relationships. So um, potentially even safety planning with those folks if, if leaving is something that they want to do. Um, and then I want to leave you with these resources. I actually saw a couple of these mentioned in the chat throughout, which is great. Um, Loveisrespect.org is an awesome organization on teen dating violence in general, but they also have a couple of specific pages about online safety and digital dating abuse. Um, a thin line.org, um, cyberbully.org. They actually um, did the research that I mentioned earlier in, in the workshop. That's not cool. And then common sense media. So I know I ran into my question and answer time about five minutes, Emily. I apologize. Um, sometimes we get chatting and there were so many good comments in the chat. I wanted to call out as many um, as I possibly could. But um, 
thank you all so much for participating. And now we'll have, I think, probably about five minutes worth of questions too. Thank you so much, Kaylee, for that presentation. That was so important and informative. Um, now I'll hand it over to my colleague, Emily Baldi, to moderate the Q&A. Thank you, Maddie, and thank you, Kaylee. That was wonderful. Um, one sort of plug that I want to make, um, someone mentioned the cues intervention in the chat, which was developed, um, I believe, by, by Dr. Liz Miller. I might be wrong there, but um, we had a webinar last month presented by Dr. Miller, um, her colleague, Lisa James, and a provider named Meg Kane from Nationwide Children's. A really wonderful webinar where they discussed the cues approach. Um, I'm going to pop the link to that recording in the chat box. I know that some folks also asked about mandated reporting and in the resources section on that recording page is a group resource from Futures that talks about mandated reporting guidelines state by state. Great. Um, we had a number of great questions. There were a few that centered on um, sexting and explicit images. And I think we really had questions um, from either end of the spectrum. So someone asked about what does it look like to talk with young people um, about sexting in a way that is healthy and non-coercive? And on the flip side, um, how do we talk with young people about the really serious emotional consequences um, that can be related to sending explicit pictures? Mm, yeah, those are both really good questions. I think one of the things that I like I mentioned before about sending images is especially depending on the age, it can have really long-term consequences. And so I don't want to ever say that to youth um, if it's consensual, I don't want it to, to feel shameful at all to them. Um, I want it to be strengths-based. So I would always frame it as, um, I don't want to say this to freak you out, to use scare tactics with you, but I, I want you to know that um, depending on where, when I was teaching this, I knew the laws in that particular state, but you know, depending on where you live, there can be some legal consequences. Um, if you take a photo that's explicit and you're a minor, if you send it, or if someone even just has it on their phone. Um, and so um, I always wanna let them know about that. Um, Cause there's, there's, you know, th there have been cases where young people have become registered sex offenders for doing that. So I want them to know that information. Um, but I think the conversation about consent in general can apply. So um, like one of my very favorite topics to talk about. So how do you know when um, someone feels uncomfortable? So talking about that, can you read their body language or facial expressions? Okay, so how can you notice that in their texting patterns? Um, if you are asking for something, they seem hesitant. How can you um, read that in that type of context? So reading some of that subtext, um, if it's in person or not. Um, I wanna say, Kaylee, that um, the person who asked the question about non-coercive sexting just clarified thank you in the chat that they were talking about explicit text not images oh okay i gotcha my mind first automatically goes to images because um, i have just seen that so much um that's a really good question and i have to be honest when i was doing a lot of this prevention education um we were focusing a little bit more on um the wider group. So it wasn't as individualized and nuanced as maybe a conversation about this would be. But I think it's still around, um, you know, getting to know your partner, understanding things that they um, like or don't like, reading those cues from them, even again, if that's in person or via text or something like that. Um, and encouraging them to have that conversation with each other um, about how do I know where your boundaries are or what is okay or not okay? And I think young people are sometimes embarrassed to have those conversations. Um, and in that case, I would say, well, if you're embarrassed about that, I would maybe rethink the explicit texts or um, conversation if you're not comfortable setting some boundaries around it first. So trying to get them think through the whole process and how it can be hurtful um, if you cross someone's boundary and how that might feel for you as well. Thank you, Kaylee. I know that there are a couple of questions that we are not going to get to, but um, my hope is that um, some of the resources Kaylee shared 
might get at those questions. Um, I would encourage you, I'm gonna ask Maddie to launch a very brief evaluation poll in Zoom. Um, I would encourage you to take the poll. It's really helpful for us um, as we consider what kind of content and in what format we use. Um, so we'll give you some time to do that. But again, Kaylee, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Um, participants, you were so active and um, thoughtful in the chat. Thank you for sharing your ideas and your resources. Um, we look forward to sharing the slides and the recording um, with you, hopefully by the end of the week. Thank you so much. Enjoy your Wednesday.